So moderating our panel this morning is our very own Professor uh, Kate Walsh from our National Security Affairs Department. Kate. Well, good morning. Uh, we have a very impressive panel for you here on day two of the current strategy forum. Um, I, I am Professor Kate Walsh, as uh, Mike said. I, I have taught policy analysis here in our National Security Affairs Department uh, since 2006. Uh, and I will uh, do a very brief bios for our very distinguished speakers and, and then get going here. Our first speaker is joining us virtually, Dr. Aaron Friedberg. Uh, Dr. Friedberg is Professor of Political and International Affairs at Princeton University, where he co-directs the School of Public and International Affairs Center for International Security Studies. He's the author of several books, co-editor of uh, at least three volumes of the National Bureau of Asian Research, or NBAR, their annual Strategic Asia series, and counselor to the NBAR. He is currently serving a two-year term uh, on the congressionally mandated U.S.-China uh, Economic and Security Review Commission, and has been a consultant for the U.S. government, including work for the National Security Council, CIA, and Office of Net Assessment in the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Uh, subsequently serving on both the Defense Policy Board and the Secretary of State's Advisory Committee on Democracy. Dr. Friedberg also served in government as Deputy Assistant for National Security Affairs and Director of Policy Planning in the Office of the Vice President from 2003 to 2005. Uh, now, uh, our MC for the current strategy forum, Mike Sherlock, uh, when he asked me to moderate this panel, uh, he noted that a couple years ago when I did this, I had uh, researched our panel and come up with some interesting information uh, of our panelists uh, on the internet. So uh, now see my panelists are getting nervous. Uh, <laughs> in addition, uh, because the bios are amazing. Uh, but what else can we learn about them? Well, it only took a little bit of internet sleuthing to uncover that another interesting tidbit about Dr. Friedberg, aside from being a doctoral advisor to several prominent China hands, uh, is also co-founder, president, and a board member, along with one of our other panelists, of the Alexander Hamilton Society, a nonpartisan, not-for-profit national organization that seeks to identify, educate, and launch young men and women into foreign policy and national security careers. Uh, in, and imbued with the Hamiltonian perspective of strong and principled American leadership in global affairs. Our next speaker, Dr. Sarah Kirchberger, uh, is here with us in person, obviously. She joins us from the University of Kiel, uh, where she is academic director of the Institute for Security Policy. At the university, Dr. Kirchberger also leads its Asia Pacific Strategy and Security Department. In addition, uh, she serves as the Vice President of the German Maritime Institute and is a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council Scowcroft Center uh, for sorry, so Strategy and Security. She also served as an Assistant Professor of Sinology at the University of Hamburg from 2010 to 16 and worked as a Naval Analyst in the Surface Vessel Division with shipbuilder TKMS from 2007 to 2010. An interesting tidbit about Dr. Kirchberger. See, now she's wondering. Uh, she also published just last year uh, with our own China Maritime Studies Institute, uh, the China, uh, the CMSI China Maritime Report, number 31, on China's submarine industrial base, state-led innovation with Chinese characteristics, uh, which you can find on our website. And I would highly recommend uh, this report. And finally, Dr. Michael O'Hanlon. Uh, so much on the internet about Michael. Uh, he's a senior fellow and holder of the Phil Knight Chair in Defense and Strategy at the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C. He teaches at Columbia University and at Georgetown University and is a member of the Defense Policy Board. Uh, Dr. O'Hanlon's latest book is Military History for the Modern Strategist, along with several other books, articles, reports, and more, including a 2022 study entitled China, uh, sorry, Can China Take Taiwan? Uh, Why No One Really Knows. Uh, this was for the Brookings Institution. And what did I learn about Dr. O'Hanlon on the internet? Well, this is uh, one thing I found. Uh, his first job was on a farm, uh, as a farm hand on a dairy farm in upstate New York. Interesting. Uh, where did I find this? On the Washingtonian Magazine's 2024 500 Most Influential People for 2024 uh, in National Security and Defense. So as promised, uh, we have a very impressive panel of experts for today's topic, Maritime Statecraft, Strategic Challenges Before America. With that, I will turn our first to our first panelist, Dr. Friedberg, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Professor Walsh. Uh, I also want to thank John Maurer for inviting me. Uh, Professor Walsh, when you were revealing things that you had learned on the internet, I thought you were going to mention that I was on uh, Dr. O'Hanlon's dissertation committee, mm -hmm. uh, but that was a long time ago, so maybe it was even before the invention of the internet. <laughs> um, 
what I'd like to do uh, this morning is to talk about what I think uh, many people will now acknowledge is a new Cold War of sorts that's underway, uh, and in particular, uh, offer some thoughts about what the implications of this new Cold War may be for U.S. Uh, naval strategy. And to put the bottom line up front, um, first, the United States clearly faces uh, large and growing challenges to its ability to project power, including naval power, into the Western Pacific. This is not news to anyone in this audience. Uh, but, and this I think is perhaps less uh, understood or gets less attention, China, for its part, uh, confronts a yawning gap between its increasingly far-flung global interests and its still very limited capacity uh, to project power in order to defend them. And I think from the point of view of American strategy, two critical questions. First, how exactly we're going to meet this challenge closer to China's shores. Obviously, that's receiving a tremendous amount of attention. And secondly, uh, perhaps less examined, the question of whether, and if so, how, to exploit the vulnerability that China has for reasons that I've just indicated. So let me start by saying a few things about uh, similarities and differences between the current situation and the one that prevailed <clears throat> during the Cold War. First, the similarities. Uh, these are geopolitical and to a lesser extent ideological, uh, a situation in which there is a Eurasian or continental coalition, uh, in this case consisting of China, Russia, Iran, maybe North Korea as a lesser partner. Uh, a grouping of authoritarian, anti-democratic, illiberal states uh, that are joined in this case, not by a common ideology, but by a shared fear and resentment of what they see as a prevailing and oppressive liberal ideology, which in their view threatens the legitimacy and stability and perhaps the survival of their domestic regimes. Uh, these are all to varying degrees and in somewhat different ways, revisionist powers. They all seek to challenge the status quo in their respective neighborhoods. And in each case, the United States is the principal obstacle to their ability to uh, achieve or fulfill their ambitions. In the case of North Korea, uh, the desire to reunify the peninsula under nor the North's control uh, would require that in some way North Korea uh, expel the United States from the peninsula, break its alliance with South Korea. In the case of Iran, uh, the Iranian leadership uh, clearly wants to establish their country as the dominant power in the Persian Gulf and beyond that in the Middle East and perhaps even further in the Islamic world. Uh, they want to destroy the state of Israel. They want to overthrow or dominate uh, the regimes of their Arab neighbors. And in order to do all of those things, they too have to find some way of pushing back the United States. Russia uh, seeks to reverse the verdict of the last Cold War uh, to reabsorb at least the Western portions of the former Soviet Union, most notably uh, Ukraine, to weaken and perhaps even to destroy NATO. And again, in order to do these things, they have to push back the United States. And finally, China uh, is attempting to reclaim what its leaders see as their rightful place as the preponderant power in Eastern Eurasia. Uh, obviously, they are intent on taking and absorbing Taiwan. Uh, they seek to weaken and, if possible, in the longer run, to subordinate uh, America's regional allies. And, of course, to do all of these things, they have to find some way of pushing back the United States from their neighborhood. So a continental coalition that's pushing outwards uh, and whose main obstacle is the United States. and that authoritarian coalition is being opposed by a coalition of democracies, which is loosely coordinated across the Indo-Pacific and the European theaters. Uh, it's led by the United States, uh, which is in order to weigh in, seeking to project power across the oceans. Uh, this is a defensive coalition. It's trying to deter aggression and trying to uh, preserve the status quo. The democracies, as they did during the last Cold War, and as perhaps democracies always do, face difficulties in mobilizing and aggregating their capabilities. Uh, 
But now, uh, as in the last Cold War, uh, the democracies still have an advantage in aggregate resources, although it's a, a smaller advantage than it once was. Two final similarities. Um, the democracies include among their number uh, experienced naval powers, especially the United States, but also Japan. And now, although their capabilities have diminished uh, a good deal, to a lesser extent, uh, the UK and also France. And the authoritarians, by comparison, are for the most part naval upstarts. Uh, this is, of course, especially true for China, which has really uh, become a naval power only in the last 40 years or so. And by comparison, of course, the United States has been a na major naval power for most of its history, so over two centuries. Finally, uh, the authoritarians today, as was true during the Cold War, face significant geographic obstacles to becoming global naval powers. Uh, they have to pass through natural barriers in order to reach open ocean. So what are some of the differences? Um, first, in the long run, I would say, by contrast to the first Cold War, Asia is going to be the primary theater of the new Cold War, geopolitical and potentially military theater, as compared to Europe, which is still important, but as compared today, as compared to the 1950s, for example, uh, Asia is the major locus for generating wealth and power, and Europe's role has diminished. Second, uh, the maritime dimension of this new and emerging rivalry is going to be critical, both in peacetime competition and in war. And in the event of war, uh, naval and also aerospace forces will play the primary role in determining the outcome of any conflict. And this I would compare it to the situation prevailing during the last Cold War, in which naval forces were largely uh, in supporting roles and supporting ground forces. And this is, of course, particularly true uh, the Central Front in Europe. China, uh, like the Soviet Union, is an historic land power that is trying to become a naval power. But uh, for the Soviet Union, that effort to make this transition from being a, a continental power to being a real global naval power came quite late in its trajectory. And in fact, really began at a point which in retrospect, it is clear, marked the uh, inflection and a beginning of the reduction in the Soviet Union's relative power. So in the 1970s and 1980s, Soviets are trying to become a major naval power just as their uh, power, relative power, is beginning to wane. And for China, by contrast, the pursuit of naval power has coincided with its very rapid rise. In fact, its rise has preceded, uh, its economic rise has preceded its efforts to become a naval power. Uh, for the Soviet Union, we can see in retrospect that uh, naval power was optional. And in fact, the resources that the Soviets invested in trying to become a naval power uh, were basically wasted. They did no good and certainly didn't influence the outcome of the Cold War. For China, by contrast, uh, becoming a naval power is, I would argue, an absolute necessity. Uh, its economic growth is dependent on continued access to the sea, both for imports and for exports. So as China has grown very rapidly, uh, its dependence on the sea has grown as well. Uh, and this creates a situation, and this is the point I wanna highlight, uh, in which China is potentially vulnerable or its ability to access the world's oceans and to use them uh, for commercial purposes is potentially vulnerable to maritime blockade or interdiction in ways that the Soviet Union never was. They were largely autarkic or dependent on their adjacent satellites. And that's a very different situation than the one China faces. Putting aside these comparisons to the Cold War, uh, let me make just a few closing observations about the naval and maritime competition, uh, which I think is now underway between the United States and to some degree its allies and China, and at least potentially some of its fellow Eurasian uh, authoritarians. And broadly speaking, uh, at least at the moment, there are two major theaters of, of engagement. Uh, first is in the Western Pacific and basically inside 
the first island chain. And second is beyond that, I would say, particularly focused in the Indian Ocean and maybe ultimately on a truly global scale. But distinguishing between that uh, that theater, which is close to China, and then further afield. In both, um, the United States and its allies started with huge advantages. I mean, if we go back to the end of the last Cold War, so the early 1990s, uh, the United States was able to operate air and naval forces right up to China's coasts and the edges of its airspace, unchallenged and un unimpeded. And also at that time, the United States had an uncontested global naval and military position and capacity to project power. In both the sort of close in and the further uh, theaters, China has pursued unconventional or asymmetric approaches to try to counter these American advantages. Uh, in the Western Pacific, China has been using uh, proximity plus mass to try, as Chinese strategists sometimes say, to control the sea from the land, um, as you are well aware, building large numbers of, of missiles, submarines, growing number of surface combatants, aircraft that can deliver missiles, and so on. Um, and the accumulation of those capabilities, certainly since the turn of the century, although it really starts to get going in the 1990s, has by now created an enormous challenge to the United States to which I and its allies, to which I referred earlier, making it much more difficult for the U.S. to contemplate projecting power into the region in ways that it might once have done very easily. On the global scale, uh, the question for Chinese strategists is how to mitigate the vulnerabilities that I referred to a moment ago, how to narrow the gap between its already enormous and growing and far-flung interests on a global scale, and its still very limited capacity to project air and naval power in order to defend those interests and to defend the lines of communication that would lead from them back to the Chinese mainland. What are the alternatives that they face? One, uh, and it may have been an option or appeared to be an option uh, in at least the opening decades of this, uh, what we see now as a new Cold War, uh, was basically to accept this vulnerability, to acknowledge that there was not very much they could do about it. They had to live with it. And the best way of dealing with it was to try to soothe the United States and get along with the United States and develop economic interdependence with the U.S. and its allies that would discourage them from ever trying to exploit this vulnerability. I think uh, from the point of view of American naval strategists, perhaps, and maybe this is less true than it was a couple of decades ago, but it seems to me the ex expectation was that China would eventually have to do what we did or we what we've done uh, given its strategic situation. In other words, to build a blue water Navy, uh, long range air uh, capabilities as well, uh, acquire bases in order to uh, stage those forces and operate them on a global scale. I would say we haven't really seen very much evidence of that yet. There are some indications that China is beginning to do some of these things, but it's still a very long way off from having every anything resembling the kind of global power projection capability that the United States has. The Chinese strategists seem to be thinking differently about this problem, and I would submit uh, that they do regard it as a serious vulnerability. They may not talk about it uh, as openly uh, uh, as such, but they have to be worried about it and they have to be thinking about it. And I think, I think we can see some of the things they've been trying to do to deal with it, but they're not the kind of conventional military measures that we might think of. One uh, has been to build overland routes, uh, rail, road, pipelines, and so on. Uh, to try to be able to uh, import and export at least some portion of what China would need to keep its economy going in the event of conflict. Um, but these are uh, very high cost, very expensive to build, and I would say of limited utility, in part because they're just limited in the volumes of material that they can carry. But nevertheless, that's the land portion of Ch China's Belt and Road Initiative, and they've been investing enormous resources in it. The second thing they've done, and this is perhaps even more impressive, is to build this massive maritime commercial fleet, um, world's largest now and largest capacity to, to build uh, maritime commercial vessels. And in addition, 
Uh, China has been building or acquiring ports at various points around the world and the infrastructure that leads in and out of those ports. These measures uh, may be sufficient to sustain and perhaps to defend China's maritime commerce in a range of, I would say, lesser contingencies. So local unrest, uh, if there's a civil war or a revolution or a conflict in a country where China has major, major investments or attacks on Chinese personnel, um, maybe uh, eventually building out this infrastructure and beginning to build more of the longer range combatants uh, and aircraft and refueling and so on that we see China beginning to do, they'll get to the point where they could conceivably take on a second tier uh, military power like India in the Indian Ocean, even though they're not at that point yet. But none of this uh, now, or it seems to me in the foreseeable future, would be of much use to China in the event of a large scale conventional conflict with the United States and with its allies. And in fact, if we imagine such a conflict, China's vast far-flung investments and its limited forward deployed military forces would be very vulnerable. Uh, some have referred to them as hostages to fortune. So that leads to a final question, which I'll, I'll end. Uh, and that is, might China's distant positions, even as they exist now, or as they may be built up over the next, say, five to 10 years, give it potential offensive op options in the event of a war, which presumably would begin in the Western Pacific, perhaps around Taiwan? Um, could it use its control of infrastructure, for example, to interfere with or to disrupt Western and allied logistics, which might be used to flow forces, equipment, and material to a conflict that was underway in the Western Pacific? Could China use uh, positions adjacent to choke points where they've concentrated a good deal of their investment, uh, potentially to launch attacks of some kind, uh, to close or to disrupt transit through some of those choke points? And we've seen some uh, indications of the possibilities of doing that with regard to the Suez Canal. Uh, we haven't heard much talk of it lately, but the Panama Canal could also be vulnerable in, in various ways. Uh, might China and maybe uh, some of its friends, I'm thinking here particularly of Russia, they seem to have an interest in this, be able to di disrupt US and allied command control or communications by cutting undersea cables? And might they encourage their friends in various parts of the world particularly in the Middle East, around the Persian Gulf, to use anti-ship weapons uh, to attack U.S. and allied forces passing by their coasts and commerce, um, as the Houthis have been trying to do, at least over the last several months. And the purpose of all of this, it seemed to me, would be to slow flows uh, of forces and equipment and or to deflect those flows from the Western Pacific, buying time for China to achieve uh, a fait accompli in a war that began there and where their principal objectives might be concentrated. So with that, uh, let me stop. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Friedberg. <laughs> and our next panel is Dr. Kurtzberger. Thank you very much, Kate, and good morning, everyone. It's a great honor to be here and address this fantastic um, conference and be on this panel. I'm very glad to be here. Thank you. Um, I wanted to pick up on something that was said yesterday uh, during the interview with David Sanger, where he talked about Russia-China relations and how to deal with their partnership or cooperation. Um, and I wanted to draw uh, from that and uh, explain a little bit how this may also relate to maritime statecraft. So uh, in that interview uh, with David Sanger, he uh, mentioned that there's uh, a feeling that this is not a real partnership or not an actual alliance and uh, that we would need to drive a wedge between it like Kissinger successfully uh, did in the 1970s. So. I happen to be a little bit more pessimistic about these assessments that he made there. I'm based on a research project I was involved in for a couple of years on Russia-China relations that grew originally from the arms trade between Russia and China. 
So ARMS technologies, sensitive projects of this type, are actually, in my view, a very good um, indicator of the actual level of cooperation between countries. It's just a given that countries that deeply distrust each other, they will not exchange particular technological secrets, in particular arms that might be turned uh, against them. So that is uh, the hypothesis that I started with. And we, we did a project where we had about 20 scholars from 10 different countries to avoid a regional bias, you could say. Russia experts, China experts, and military experts work on this together. And we looked at empirical evidence of actual changes in cooperation in particularly sensitive fields of strategic relevance, not just arms trade, but also geostrategically important cooperation forms, internet censorship, and stuff like that. And we conducted a series of workshops, worked over this since about 2019. And over the uh, course of two years, uh, actually we concluded our research right after the Ukraine war had started. Um, there was not a single scholar in our group anymore after exchanging all the data, discussing it, that did not think that this is not already effectively an alliance. So we actually did an exercise where we wanted to debate the two positions, like one position, this is factually an alliance, and the other position, they will never actually be partners. We couldn't find a volunteer who wanted to take the second position. So that was an interesting outcome. And my view is that often people who, who make the case that this is not actually a cooperation um, they often neglect one of the areas of uh, cooperation that is factually happening. So, so sometimes it's a lack of looking at the full data that is available. And that's not to be wondered at because um, a lot of that happens a little bit be beneath the surface. One needs to know where to look and who to ask. The other point is how much cooperation and unity is, is actually to be expected among allies. I mean, look at the NATO alliance. It's actually pretty normal to have diverging views and diverging national interests competing even among treaty allies. Just look at Greece and Turkey and how they often etch at each other's throats. And I remember Secretary General Stoltenberg once making the point that it's actually not to be wondered at if, if allies disagree. The truly, truly remarkable thing is if they can agree on something. So that is from his point of view, leading NATO. Uh, I think so we per perhaps have an unrealistic expectation of how much unity can be expected between countries like Russia and China. And as to Kissinger being effective driving a wedge, I would argue there was no need to drive a wedge at that point because they had been in a state of factual enmity for quite a while. There was a Sino-Soviet split going on since 1960. So they, they were, had been actually at war with each other and considered each other enemies. So um, there was no split uh, to be engineered. It was already there. And we are living in a very different world right now where, where the situation is completely reversed. As to us being able to drive a wedge between Russia and China, I'm again a little bit pessimistic because I'm not quite sure what lever we could use for that, what we could actually bring to the forefront to counter the powerful synergies that currently exist between Russia and China. And I would actually argue perhaps they have been rather good at driving wedges between our alliances at some points. For instance, in July 2019, when Russia and China conducted their first joint strategic bomber aircraft exercise in an area between South Korea and Japan that contains disputed territory, Dokdo, and managed to uh, basically force Japan and South Korea both to send interceptor planes and then getting you know, at loggerheads with each other. It basically led to an ice age between South Korea and Japan because of this disputed territory between them. And um, that was rather, I think, a genius move by Russia and China to, to, to target these you know, fractions in, in the US-led alliance system. And it took a while, actually several years, to overcome uh, 
that rift. And in Europe, we have, for instance, Hungary constant and EU, EU member and NATO member constantly being difficult about China policy and Russia policy. So there's another example of where they have been quite successful maybe in, in driving a wedge in our own alliances. So this is um, something to be kept in mind. And uh, maybe rather than thinking of the wedges we could drive, maybe we should think about how to fortify our own alliance. And uh, it shouldn't be noted that how to deal with China and how to deal with Russia is one of the key things that currently divides the transatlantic alliance with people arguing like this is the more important threat to focus on or this is this is not as important. And I would argue we need to face this as a joint problem. It is, it is one problem set. And these two theaters, Asia Pacific and Europe, are interlinked. And what happens in one affects the other. So it's not two different problem sets. So right now, they have powerful synergies. And uh, their economies are pretty complementary in terms of structural uh, complementarity. So one has what the other needs. Raw materials and arms technologies is what Russia can offer. Huge market, financial power is what uh, China can offer. China is enabling the war in Ukraine by offering its market power to Russia at a time when it's under sanctions. And they share this threat perception that was already outlined, having the same set of, of basic beliefs about core interests, about being uh, focused on removing US preeminence in the world, uh, living with a sort of a political ideological threat perception that the regime is threatened by color revolutions and subversion from within and without, also feeling geostrategically vulnerable, in particular China when it comes to its nuclear deterrent, its, its sea-based nuclear deterrent, then also feeling technologically speaking at still at a disadvantage compared with the United States and its allies, for instance, in terms of semiconductor technology, and also being vulnerable to economic warfare or sanctions warfare, which is how, how they call it. So both have a lot to gain also from not having to fortify their joint border as much as they used to have. So that frees a lot of military um, potential to, to bring to other theaters. And both also are joined in this perception that they have territorial rights to, to territories outside of the internationally recognized borders and that they are somehow entitled to have a sort of a sphere of influence around them in their periphery and be entitled to be dominating the smaller powers in the periphery. So unless the current leadership in either of these two countries or both of these countries changes, I would say this is a set of synergies that I cannot really see how we could drive a wedge between them. As far as I'm concerned, they are like-minded countries currently. So um, maybe the whole question also about whether this relationship has limits, certainly it has limits, every relationship has limits, uh, or not, maybe this is not the right question to ask. And maybe also the question whether it will ever be a formal treaty alliance is maybe not the right question to ask. I think it's a bit misplaced to focus on that. And let me draw on a historical example why the Hitler-Stalin pact, uh, that you probably all know uh, a lot about is, is an example where two powers cooperated only very briefly, only for a very short few years before one turned on the other, Germany on the Soviet Union. But during those short few years, they started World War II together, invading Poland, Soviet Union, invading Finland, and so on. And in that, in that sense, the durability and stability of such an alliance is not really what worries me the most. What worries me the most is what can they do together even if it lasts only a very short time. So uh, if we go back to the question of the wedge, what could drive a wedge between them today? What drove a wedge between Germany and the Soviet Union uh, during World War II was among others, the fact that the Soviet Union failed miserably trying to conquer Finland. That showed that the Soviet military was far less capable than everyone had 
had thought. And this was probably one of the reasons why Hitler decided to turn on the Soviet Union. We could extrapolate from that if Russia fails to decisively conquer Ukraine, maybe that could have also the effect of making Russia much less of an attractive and f also feared partner of China. So we might be thinking of bolstering Ukraine more in order to make sure that Russia is not successful on that front. China was probably very surprised at uh, how resilient Ukraine has been through these past couple of years and has probably not been very happy about the course of the war, including the excessive brutality of Russia that makes China look bad by association. And also um, the performance of the Russian technology on the battlefield was probably something of a surprise to China and not necessarily a welcome surprise. And I think the Prigozhin rebellion in June last year, when a faction within the, China, uh, the Russian military turned against the leadership, that was probably the nadir where, where China saw how risky a military adventure of this type can be if it basically your own military um, starts fighting itself. So that would have been, in Chinese terms, I think the nightmare scenario. And, one would have hoped that this whole rebellion would have lasted a little bit longer. I think it could have offered a powerful deterrent against military adventurism to China. The Chinese uh, Navy and naval shipbuilding industry is looking at the performance of the Russian Navy right now in the Black Sea. Uh, well, what I've heard and seen is a lot of contempt coming from Chinese circles on the lack of quality of the ships, the lack of the warfighting skills. Uh, so that has definitely been a massive shift in China's perception of the Russian military capability. And China has, on the other hand, probably now a great opportunity to study drone warfare, in particular the maritime drones that Ukraine is developing. Also the missiles, like the Neptune missile that Ukraine has been using against Russian ships. So, that, that was probably scary for China, but also very highly educative. So they will be using all their resources to get to the bottom of um, what to learn from, from this example and extrapolating from that for their own um, planning. Another thing that China has been able to learn uh, from this conflict is the effective, effective, <laughs> efficacy of nuclear blackmail. So Russia has been using its nuclear arsenal effectively um, to insulate itself from outside interventions in this conflict. And this is one of the things that worries me very much because China, of course, could resort to similar tactics using nuclear uh, threats to basically deter outside intervention in any of its territorial um, conflicts. So this is another thing where we need to think right now, how, what kind of an example are we giving? What kind, of, uh, what kind of a picture are we providing to China in terms of how we react to these types of threats? Being overly um, worried about Russia starting a nuclear war could encourage China to resort to the same um, tactics. China is still very much inferior to Russia in terms of its nuclear um, arsenal, n not just numerically, but also when it comes to sea-based deterrent, where uh, China is just geographically disadvantaged, not having a long Arctic coastline like Russia, where to establish a bastion. But um, Arctic basing and Russian ports would be something that could be highly attractive to China if it could convince Russia to allow that, because the striking range from the Arctic high north is just so much shorter to reach uh, the Western Alliance as a whole. So this is one of the things that we also need to worry about in the shifting uh, relationship between Russia and China. How dependent does Russia become on China? And could China use this to gain a foothold in the high north, even for except Marines? And the imbalances in this relationship are tilting into such a direction with, with Russia becoming economically, polit politically, almost completely dependent on uh, Chinese support. And there are, there are some indications recently of, of something shifting in this regard maybe. So for one thing, 
for a couple of years now, there has been an intense, apparently, research cooperation in the Russian Arctic, uh, in the Russian Asian Arctic, um, about undersea warfare technologies between Russian and Chinese military research facilities. So about 100 scholars and at least 30 different uh, closely uh, with cooperating closely with the military um, researchers and research facilities from both countries have been working together on polar acoustics, fiber optic hydrophone development, underwater communication and robotics in ice covered waters. So that has been going on. There are regular symposiums happening and uh, at least since mid-2019, that is a thing. So it predates the Ukraine war. Further, we have indications from Chinese technical uh, research journals that since at least 2018, there is research activity going on on developing ice-class submarine hulls. So there have been mathematical modeling articles on hull strength and stability during the surfacing process through an ice sheet and uh, propeller movement in ice-covered waters and also um, one article from 2020 that I saw that uh, uh, on submarine navigation in the Arctic. So China calls itself a near Arctic country, but actually its northernmost point is on the same geographic uh, north, northern, uh, northern uh, extension as Hamburg, Germany, where I'm from. It's, I can tell you it's not an Arctic location. <laughs> Yeah, so there's also another thing, a new development last year, I think April 2023, a memorandum of understanding was signed between the Chinese Coast Guard and the Russian FSB Border Guard that is in charge of safeguarding the Arctic coastline. And the memorandum says that they want to cooperate in law enforcement at sea near Murmansk, near the Kola Peninsula, the Russian submarine bastions. My question would be, what exactly, what kind of law enforcement exactly is China going to do there? Are they going to combat human trafficking or uh, smuggling or, you know, piracy near Murmansk? It's, it's a bit weird. And finally, just last year, on Putin's birthday, by the way, we had a minor incident in the Baltic Sea. The Sevmore Put, a Russian nuclear-powered ship, cooperated with a Hong Kong-flagged vessel, the polar, New New Polar Bear, to sever uh, the Baltic connector gas pipeline and several internet cables in the Baltic Sea, dragging its anchor for hundreds of miles across the seafloor. So that was an incident where a Chinese and Russian vessel apparently cooperated to destroy critical infrastructures of NATO member countries. It was a little bit drowned out by the Gaza uh, war basically starting on the same day, so the Hamas attack on Israel. So it wasn't in the news as much as it would have been. But um, as far as I've heard from the investigating sides in Finland, for instance, uh, China is not fully cooperating with this investigation, and this points to China being somehow complicit in the whole thing, if after the fact or, or during. So this is um, a new development, again, weird, because what does China have to gain from it by um, presenting itself as, as a threat, a security threat directly to Europe, that would be a departure from previous Chinese strategy towards Europe, presenting itself as a business partner, not a military threat. But anyway, it's, it's what we're faced with, and I would strongly warn against ignoring the empirical evidence of cooperation because of some belief, like a belief that this is not a partnership or something like that. Uh, belief is, is very good in, in religious context, but it's, it's not very useful when it comes to dealing with what we're faced with. Well, last, uh, what could Russia maybe gain from closer cooperation with China? The decimated Russian military could rearm itself much more quickly and cost-efficiently if it tapped into China's superior 
industrial base. For instance, the Navy could get ships much quicker at much better prices if it had them built by China in China. And there's an indication for that maybe being on the, on the plate because the Russian Navy commander at the time, he was still a Yevmenov when he was the Navy commander last year, he visited the Shanghai shipyard and looked at some of the news pro building projects there. So that might be an indication of such an interest. So to conclude, I am afraid we have to confront the unsavory reality that this is de facto something like an alliance, a collusion, and that we are headed indeed to a new type of Cold War. I think we need to watch our own reactions to nuclear blackmail coming from Russia because of the danger that we will be giving an incentive to China to, to copy that approach. We must definitely try and guard our remaining technological advantage a little better and try and make it harder for both Russia and China to uh, rearm themselves even faster or arm themselves even faster. From a US standpoint, you might want to reflect what is the value of your alliances? I, I hear often a little bit of a doubt about the value. I would think the frontline states that are direct neighbors of your two big problem countries, they know actually best how they function. That would be maybe Japan in, in terms of looking at China, and there would be Finland and the Baltics and Poland when it comes to Russia. So having them as allies is, is probably worthwhile as such because they, they are uh, helpful in understanding the nature of the problem. And the point that Paul Kennedy mentioned yesterday where he said that we should not neglect to look at the vulnerabilities and weaknesses of our opponents a little bit more and not make them out to be these you know, giants that cannot, cannot be confronted in any way. I think that's a very good point. They do have a lot of vulnerabilities, a lot of dependencies, a lot of fears. A lot of what they do is actually driven by the sense of inferiority and vulnerability. And we would do well to look into this a little bit more systematically and think about how to use these, um, these things that we might find out. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. O'Han. Thank you, Kate. Uh, greetings, everyone. It's a real privilege to be back at the Naval War College, one of our country's great institutions of higher education and certainly military planning. Great privilege to be with my good friend, Aaron Friedberg, uh, who helped me get started in this field, for better or worse, Aaron, uh, almost like 35 years ago. And, uh, and that was a fantastic presentation as well, Sarah. I wanted to try to be provocative and tee up the conversation and build on a little bit of what we've already heard on this panel and other panels, and suggest five places where U.S. naval war planning and military force planning generally need to improve and haven't quite yet confronted the world we're talking about and the world that we know we're entering into. The good news is I can think of solutions, and I believe many in the Navy already are thinking of solutions for four of the five problems. But the last one, I don't know how to solve, and I'll need your help, uh, and we'll hopefully be able to discuss that a little bit. Let me just tee off the five that I'm going to talk about and then say a couple of words on each. First, I still don't think we have a great framework for sizing the Navy, and the 355 ship fleet goal is anachronistic. Second, we have not yet hedged against the scenario of China invading Taiwan adequately. It's a scenario we should be able to plan against effectively, but I don't think we've done enough with new technologies that are less vulnerable uh, to Chinese preemption than some of the assets we depend on today. Third, uh, I think we have to think harder about the homeland and making sure the Navy and the other services can actually get from the homeland what they need to function effectively abroad. I think the homeland is more vulnerable, not just in a general sense, not just in terms of population, but in terms of naval power projection uh, and things that are essential for that purpose. Fourth, and building on a point Aaron made, I think we have to think harder about dealing with China away from Taiwan, away from the Western Pacific, and exploiting Chinese vulnerability. So asymmetric approaches to putting Chinese assets at risk. And then fifth, I think that we need to look harder, building on what Sarah just said, about the possibility of simultaneous challenges 
in different parts of the world. Not that Russia and China or Russia and Iran or China and North Korea would literally fight for each other, but we have no reason to rule out opportunistic aggression. And we need more of a hedge against that than the current national defense strategy provides. So those are my five points. Let me start with the 355 ship Navy. Maybe you know better than I do, but as best I can tell, this is still a goal for the US and it goes back to a study done about 10 years ago which with all due respect, and I understand how hard you have to work to answer the call of the commander in chief and other parts of the government and country that want us to be present around the world. It was done the wrong way because it was based on 2015 operational requirements, not on the future security environment. And because it takes 20, 30 years to build a Navy, if you're gonna look backward to build your fleet and you're gonna look at day-to-day -day requirements, I would submit you're not doing it the right way. And the good news is, uh, we probably don't need to deviate too far from that goal, and we're not going to get to that goal anytime soon anyhow. And so in a way, it's, it's harmless because it's almost meaningless. But that's a pretty sorry way to think about our vision for the future Navy. And it feels to me, you may know differently, that it feels to me like we're, we're adding pieces here and there, for example, with certain unmanned underwater vehicles or unmanned surface vehicles, that, uh, and, and, you know, I think formal Navy force planning has added a certain number, several dozen of those categories to the 355 ship manned ship pre-existing baseline. But I think it's time to start this from scratch or at least have a, a few really good papers come out of the Naval War College that propose alternative fleet design uh, because I, I just think we're stuck in what was actually an outdated plan even when it first came out 10 years ago because again, it was built on operational requirements for maintaining peacetime presence and crisis response, not high-end warfighting. Second, on the Taiwan challenge, the good news is that it's really hard for China to invade Taiwan, even if we are vulnerable at Kadena Air Base, even if we are vulnerable with aircraft carriers in the Western Pacific. We have lots of different kinds of assets that we can use to try to sink those Chinese ships. And as Aaron has written in his excellent Adelphi paper on Beyond Air Sea Battle and others have explored, the challenges of protecting big assets on the sea mean in today's world of, of 360 degree coverage, multiple sensor networks, and precision strike weaponry, not to mention a very effective quiet submarines. The good news is it's hard for China to get across the strait. The bad news is we should make it even harder so they're never tempted. And that's a soluble problem, largely with things like vertical lift aircraft on Okinawa that would fire anti-ship missiles rather than depending on planes that need Kadena's runways. And also, we should have unmanned underwater vehicles pre-stationed, essentially permanently stationed in the Western Pacific that are not vulnerable, at least across the fleet, not vulnerable to Chinese preemption the way that an aircraft carrier within 1,000 miles of uh, China's coastline probably is. So I don't think it's super expensive to buy these systems, and I think it should be a joint service effort. Thankfully, the Marine Corps is doing some of this already with its littoral combat regiments. So hats off to Marines. And I think General Berger had a good vision on this as Commandant that General Smith continues to pursue. Uh, but I think the Navy and the Air Force need to get in on this a little bit more effectively than at least I've seen them do so far. Uh, a third point would be on the question of, again, asymmetry, fighting China in the Indian Ocean, for example, interdicting supply lines. The good news is you have, we have the best assets in the world already to do this, basically uh, nuclear powered attack submarines and to some extent a long range land based aircraft. But I don't know that we've done enough force sizing. I don't know, I, I, the submarine fleet's probably too small for all the things we're asking of it. It's too strained and uh, of course I don't know how many submarines we typically have in the Indian Ocean at a given moment. We could always surge in the event of war, but I, 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 I sense that we need more capacity. And since the AUKUS deal has got us thinking about expanding submarine shipbuilding capacity, I think it's time to pursue that a bit more. You don't have to believe the aircraft carrier is obsolete to believe that, as I do, that uh, attack submarines are relatively more important today and carriers slightly less important or relevant for the kinds of security challenges that we face. So I would advocate sort of rethinking by 10 to 20% our force sizing metrics in each of those domains. So even in a zero budget sum kind of exercise, we can still build more submarines with the given Navy budget. A fourth area, as I mentioned, is the homeland. 
and with the, with the defense of the homeland, I'm talking about naval ports that are probably more vulnerable to drone attack and missile attack than we are bothering to worry about. We Americans are used to the homeland being sanctuary, even though, of course, it hasn't been historically as much as we want to believe. You all know, obviously, we all know the history of December 7th, 1941, and also September 11th, 2001. But I don't really think we've updated our thinking for an era of proliferating drones and missiles. Uh, we probably need to think harder about limited ballistic missile defense, not so much in terms of protecting our nuclear forces, but in terms of protecting our conventional forces and the key supply lines and national infrastructure that are required to sustain forward deployment. So this is not just naval ports and things within the purview of the Navy, it's also infrastructure that currently is not protected by any part of the government because it's in private hands. Rails, electricity lines, petroleum facilities. We probably need a more comprehensive strategy. And by the way, I'm blaming myself too. I'm not here to blame you or blame the DOD or the Navy. Uh, this is a problem that I need to think harder about as an analyst at Brookings. Uh, but I think we have assumed too long that what we have here in the homeland is safe and the private sector and civilian infrastructure that DOD requires in order to project and sustain power is either safe or being taken care of by somebody else. Those are not correct assumptions, as best I can tell. And then um, I mentioned the idea of simultaneity of more than one crisis at a time. If you read the, the Secretary Mattis National Defense Strategy of 2018, and then essentially the repeat of that in the Obama, or excuse me, the Biden uh, Austin Strategy of 2022, it's remarkable how much they agree for two presidents who don't agree that much on anything. Uh, but those strategies both say we need to be able to fight and defeat either Russia or China, but not the other, while maintaining deterrence of North Korea and Iran, maintaining momentum in the war on terror, because the Mattis strategy came out in 2018 when we hadn't yet defeated ISIS. And then finally, maintaining some kind of protection of the homeland. The, the problem that most countries begin with, but we almost add as an afterthought. And what I would suggest to you is we need not multiple all-out war capability, because we don't have the money for that, and if we try to build a force structure to do that, we would need conscription, and we would need a 1.5 to $2 trillion a year military budget. And that would also interfere with our, our efforts to modernize and focus on quality and survivability rather than size. However, I do think we need specific assets for specific theaters that can remain in place or quickly deploy on a limited basis, essentially to do a hold kind of operation in conjunction with local allies while we go out and try to fight and win the big war and also build up more force structure as we're fighting. And so, for example, in the Middle East, we need some degree of air and missile defense and sensor networks to help support them, even if we're fighting China over Taiwan because otherwise what Iran just tried to do to Israel could happen, for example. And in Europe, we need some ability to keep at least a brigade of army forces and several squadrons of land-based fighter aircraft in Eastern Europe to work with NATO to make sure Russia doesn't feel tempted to try to slice off a piece of Latvia if and when we're fighting Taiwan. So these are, I think, limited force packages, but I think we need a bigger debate about what to do in the event of simultaneity. The, the final problem, and I'll finish on this, and the one that I don't know how to solve, because I think it's daunting. Kate mentioned the paper I worked on two years ago where I tried to use some simple military modeling uh, methods of a type that uh, Aaron begrudgingly let me put into my dissertation. <laughs> Actually, not, I don't think he was begrudging at all, but he and I both know the limitations of simple modeling. And I'm not going to claim that I figured out how a Taiwan blockade scenario would actually play out. But what I try to do is something that I believe you can use simple military modeling techniques to try to achieve, which is to create a plausible lower bound and a plausible upper bound, a plausible optimistic case and a plausible pessimistic case for how a given scenario might play out. One mistake we still make in force planning and in combat simulation in the United States, whether it's inside the DOD world or outside, is to think that we can do a single point prediction of how a war will end. That's silly. 
War is way too complicated to believe that we can be that precise. So the right way to model, I am firmly persuaded, is always to try to do a plausible optimistic and a plausible pessimistic case. And then, then you can debate which sets of assumptions are more credible, are more likely to play out, and then you can, you can have a good debate about which scenario is more plausible than the other. But it's a cardinal sin of defense planning to think you can predict an outcome. Secretary Rumsfeld did it in Iraq, before Iraq. Uh, we did it in Vietnam. We do it too much still. It's sort of in our DNA, and we think when we start doing math, we have to come up with a single answer like it's our eighth grade arithmetic homework, but it's not. We should know better. And with war, I think that if you, if you ever believe you can see how it's going to play out and how it's going to end, of course, you are ignoring Clausewitz and everybody else who's ever written on the subject. So what I try to do in this paper, and I'm happy to talk about some of the details if you like, but I try to make assumptions about the likelihood a Chinese submarine could penetrate a given anti-submarine warfare barrier, the likelihood of a Chinese missile being intercepted by an American missile defense system, and I tried to vary these kinds of things, the lethality of Chinese anti-ship missiles and torpedoes, and I tried to imagine a blockade scenario where China deployed most of its submarine fleet to try to sink some ships coming in and out of Taiwan in an effort to strangle the island economically. And then we, working with Taiwan and perhaps Japan, and perhaps one or two other countries try to break the blockade by establishing a safe shipping corridor. It's an extremely daunting proposition, as I'm sure many of you understand better than I. And all the advantages I was talking about earlier in defeating the invasion scenario, because the other guy has to put big, shiny, slow objects on the surface of the earth where we can see them, or on the surface of the sea. All those disadvantages now accrue to us, because we have to protect vulnerable shipping with our vulnerable ships and in an area close to Taiwan. So I don't know who wins this war if we play it out the way I did. Now, whenever you model, you have to make simplifying assumptions, and it's not going to mimic reality perfectly. But basically, what I tried to do was ask, can we sink the Chinese submarine fleet before they can sink our escort fleet? And I sort of simplified it into that kind of analysis. There are obviously a million permutations you could run as to whether China might try to destroy port infrastructure on Taiwan, how successful they'd be with that. Obviously, whether we want to go destroy the ports that the Chinese submarines use or just wait sort of in, you know, in ambush outside of those ports to try to prevent escalation by direct attack against the Chinese homeland. There are a million variants off of this scenario, but the one that I looked at suggested to me that with a very plausible set of assumptions, China could win. And with another equally plausible set of assumptions, but more favorable to us, we might win, sinking the Chinese submarine fleet before it can annihilate our convoy escort capability. And so I don't know how to solve this problem because it's too complicated and too daunting. And I don't think even a 400 ship US Navy would be big enough to guarantee a win. So I think, I'll finish on this point, I don't know how to solve this problem in military planning terms. I think the essence of the solution is what Secretary Austin calls integrated deterrence, where you imagine a much broader kind of response, including essentially economic warfare. Uh, not just the kind of things Elizabeth Economy was talking about for a peacetime strategy, but a dramatic escalation in terms of wartime strategy and make sure China knows that we're planning this way and that we're resilient against its economic warfare countermeasures. Uh, because the, the blockade problem is much more daunting, I think, to solve analytically or pragmatically. And by the way, I think it's the one China will use if they ever decide to use force. The invasion scenario is all or nothing, cosmic roll of the dice, and we should be able to prevent it. The blockade scenario, combined with maybe gray area warfare, you know, inching up to actual lethal use of of military force, but only in limited amounts. It's a much more plausible scenario. China can dial it up, dial it down. They don't have to kill a lot of Taiwanese or anybody else to start the strategy working. And uh, it's, it fits too with China uh, and its history of using force as much to change psychology and create a coercive environment as to achieve a direct battlefield outcome. So I'll finish there and look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, and, and let me say the uh, report that Dr. O'Hanlon is talking about is available for free. Uh, the great thing about a public policy think tank, uh, free on the brookings.edu uh, website. So with that, uh, I think we're out of time here, so please join me in thanking our panelists.